The key to becoming an efficient programmer is to never write any bugs. Unfortunately, that's virtually impossible. When your code doesn't work as expected, 99% of the time, it's your own code to blame. You cannot blame that on me. However, about 0.99% of the time, it's the fault of somebody else on your team, and you can get pissed off at them accordingly. <laughs> But the other 0.0099% of the time, it's a bug in some shady library you downloaded from NPM, which means you'll have to open up an issue on its GitHub repo, or fix it yourself and open a pull request, or just build your own new library from scratch. However, the other 0.0009% of the time, it's the programming language or compiler itself to blame, in which case you'll need to get in touch with some people much smarter than yourself who determine it's not a bug with the compiler, but it's an edge case that happens 0.0000099% of the time, and the actual hardware where is to blame, like one transistor was placed just a few nanometers to the left, and that's why your website doesn't look quite right on a BlackBerry. But the hardware people say it's not their fault, it's actually just an edge case that happens 0.0000001% of the time, where your code is just not compatible with the laws of quantum superposition due to a defect in the simulation in which we live. In other words, it's God's will that thou code shall not work. Luckily, bugs like this are pretty rare, and in today's video, we'll look at seven universal debugging tips that every developer should be familiar with. The first tip is to read. That may seem stupidly obvious, but programmers want to get things done quickly and tend to be overconfident in their understanding of what the hell the computer is actually doing. What'll often happen is you'll guess what a method or function is doing based on its name. But remember, there are only two hard problems in computer science, naming things and coming up with new original jokes for YouTube tutorials. Like there might be a function called get random number, you automatically think it's always going to return a different number, but when you call it, it returns three every time. It's not a bug because had you read the documentation, you know that 3 is a random number that was chosen by the developer in advance, who guaranteed that it was 100% random when he chose it with the roll of a die. Reading documentation in advance is important, but developers also tend to skip right over error messages. When first learning to code, you get these big cryptic error messages that seem totally overwhelming, so instead of reading it, you just try to change up your code until the message goes away. That might work sometimes, but you'd be much better off learning how to understand the error messages and go through a stack trace, because that will eliminate the guesswork. Now most of the time, even after you read the error, you'll still have no idea what it's talking about. Luckily, there's a very powerful tool that can help you translate it, called Google. But when it comes to error messages, you don't want to just paste the entire error message with the full stack trace into Google. Googling as a software engineer is an art form. You'll want to first parse the error and remove anything that's unique to your actual project. Google is pretty good at ignoring things that are unnecessary, but the more you can do to point it in the right direction, the better. If the keywords from the error are pretty generic, you might also want to add the name of your language or framework to the beginning, just to limit the number of results. I couldn't imagine living without Google and Stack Overflow, but at some point you'll hit a wall and have to do some good old-fashioned honest programming. The easiest way to approach debugging is with logging, where you simply print out different pieces of data from your application to manually verify that it's running as expected. It's not very sophisticated, but it works. A JavaScript beginner might use console log to print out every single variable, but your logger probably has more tricks up its sleeve, like JavaScript has console count to keep a running counter in your code, or timer to measure time, and table to to format things in a more user-friendly way. You can also log at different levels, like info, warning, and error, to organize the priority of this data, and use console dir to display it as a hierarchy. The bottom line is that logging is a perfectly acceptable way to debug, and you should take some time to learn the full API of the logger in your language to maximize its efficacy. The problem with logging, though, is that it gets harder and harder to do as your code grows larger and more complex. Luckily, modern IDEs and editors have tools that can help you observe and execute your code at scale. These tools are called debug buggers, and there's one integrated directly into VS Code. It allows you to traverse through frames in the call stack, which means you can pinpoint the exact moment a bug occurs. It's possible to pause the execution of your code at any time using a debugger statement, or better yet, you can use the IDE to set up breakpoints that don't require any modifications to the actual code. In addition, it eliminates the need to pollute your code with console logs everywhere, because instead, you can just add log points by clicking next to the line of code that you want to log. So basically, a debugger is just a more sophisticated way to run run and inspect your code. Eventually you'll find a bug that you just cannot fix. When that happens, it can sometimes help to not focus on a solution, but figure out a way to reproduce the problem with a minimal amount of code, like start an entirely new project where the only goal is to make this problem happen. And bonus points if you can reproduce it somewhere like StackBlitz, where anyone can run it instantly in a browser. Creating a reproduction has several benefits. One, there's a good chance you'll solve the problem when going through it. And two, if you don't find the root problem, you now have an example that you can share with better programmers. If 
you can't reliably reproduce a problem, it's nearly impossible for anyone else to help you out. Unfortunately, not every bug can be reproduced, which is called a Heisen bug. There's a great story about the Crash Bandicoot video game, where the load save feature would work perfectly almost every time, but every once in a while it would time out and wipe out the entire memory card. After six weeks of trying to debug this one issue, they were eventually able to reproduce it by wiggling the PS1 controller a certain way to corrupt the memory card. It was one of those rare cases where the hardware was at fault. Another very common type of bug that is very frustrating is one that happens after your code was working perfectly before. This is called a regression, which means you wrote some new code that fucks something up. At a certain point, it becomes impossible for a human to verify that everything works properly after every code change. And that's where automated testing comes in, or test-driven development. I've made many videos in the past about testing, but the general idea is that you write code to make sure that your other code is working as expected. Most importantly, it gives you the confidence that you're not introducing new bugs when you make changes, but it can also help in the debugging process. When you encounter a bug, instead of trying to fix it right away, you can go straight to writing a test. This forces you to be explicit about what you're actually trying to make the code do, and in the process you'll likely learn things about your code that you didn't understand previously. And finally, after you get the test to pass, you'll be protected from reintroducing the same bug. Another way to catch bugs before they become a problem is to use a tool that performs some type of static analysis on your code. In the case of JavaScript, the most common way to do that is to use TypeScript, which adds an entire type system on top of the language, which makes it far more difficult to introduce stupid bugs like using the wrong variable name somewhere, or assigning the wrong data type, because the TypeScript compiler won't even let you run your code when you make mistakes like this. The drawback is that TypeScript can be a pretty big investment and you may not want to add it to your code base. In that case, consider adding ESLint by itself to your project. It also performs static analysis and attempts to improve your code quality and requires very little effort on your part. That gives us seven different ways to debug code, but I have one more bonus tip for you, which is to turn off your computer and take a break. If I had a dollar for every time I was fighting a bug, then went and took a break, and came back and immediately solved it, I would have a shitload of dollars. I like to go outside, get some exercise, bask in the sun, and enjoy a smooth and flavorful Marlboro cigarette. Marlboro may surprise you. It's the filter cigarette with the unfiltered taste. On second thought, you may want to skip the cigarette, unless your goal is to die a horrible agonizing death. And if you go to hell, the only programming language they have down there is Java. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.